welcome everyone, those of you who are able to join us in person on the campus of the University of Michigan, and those of you who are able to join us over Zoom. Uh, my name is Benjamin Paloff. I'm the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Michigan, and I have the very real honor of being host to this, what has been a wonderful uh, uh, symposium, a very celebratory event on uh, the uh, translation networks that have brought uh, Eastern European, Central European, and Eurasian literature to North America and around the world since the Cold War and into the present. Uh, we had had three wonderful discussions this morning. Uh, this afternoon, we continue with uh, two out-of-town guests who are here in person and one who will be joining us remotely. Uh, uh, so we have two speakers for this uh, panel, uh, which is really about thinking <clears throat> from the historical, sort of taking the historical perspective we were discussing this morning and extending it into the, into the present and the future. Um, so our, uh, we will be taking uh, questions uh, uh, both live as well as uh, over Zoom. So if you do have a question or a comment that you wish for us to share with our panelists, uh, please put that in the Q&A uh, using that function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our two speakers for this panel are Joanna Chechek and uh, Russell Scott Valentino. I'll introduce both of them at once, uh, and, uh, and then we'll just flow right into their, um, into their discussion. Um, the, uh, as, as far as I know, it, Russell will be going first, yes? So uh, Russell Scott Valentino is professor and chair in the Department of Slavic Languages uh, or Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures at Indiana University. He has authored two scholarly monographs, co-edited three collections of articles and essays, and translated eight book-length literary works from Bosnian, uh, Croatian, Serbian, which we in the field refer to simply as BCS because it's a little less cumbersome, uh, Italian and Russian. His publications have appeared in the New York Times, American Poetry Review, Modern Fiction Studies, the Harvard Review, and elsewhere. He has served as editor-in-chief at the Iowa Review from uh, 2009 to 2013, uh, president of the American Literary Translators Association from 2013 to 2016, and senior editor at Autumn Hill Books since 2005, as we heard this morning. Uh, he currently serves on the jury for the 2022 National Book Awards. And after we hear from Professor Valentino, we will hear from Professor Ioana Chechak hus who is Associate Professor at Kent State University. Uh, she will be joining us on person, uh, in person and uh, Professor Valentino over Zoom. Uh, Professor Chechak hus uh, research concerns collaborative translation, self-translation, 20th and 21st century Russian and Polish literatures, and issues at the intersection of literature and philosophy. She has written on the poetry of Anna Akhmadova, the self-translations of Vladimir Nabokov, the poetry of Tadeusz Ruzhevich, and translation as a palimpsest. She is the editor of a special issue of the Polish Review um, devoted to the Nobel laureate Olga Tokarczuk, um, for which I'm very grateful, both because it's a wonderful issue, but also because she invited me to contribute modestly to that volume. Uh, her translations from Polish and Russian have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Times Literary Supplement, Harper's, The Atlantic, Paris Review, I could go on, uh, Fields, Vizda, Boston Review, Nonsite, New Ohio Review, many others. Uh, her books of poetry translation include Miracle Fair, Selected Poems of Wisława Szymborska, published by W.W. W. Norton, and Sobbing Superpower, Selected, wow, that sounds topical. Sobbing Superpower, Selected Poems of Tadeusz Ruzhevich, uh, uh, also published by Norton, and her collection, her, uh, her, her uh, translation Firebird, Firebird, the Collected Poems of Zuzana Ginchanka, is forthcoming in 2022 from Zephyr Press. Um, she is the recipient of the 2020 Michael Heim Prize, uh, to name yet another name that keeps coming up, uh, the Michael Heim Prize for Collegial uh, Translation. Uh, so without further ado, let us uh, bring in Professor Valentino over Zoom. 
Thank you, Thank uh, you. Ben. Uh, very nice to be here and to take part. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for organizing um, this um, this event. Uh, I think, uh, it, especially for this particular moment, our field is uh, having a little bit of a crisis and to put it mildly. And so any uh, collective uh, and positive communication among amongst us can be very, can be very good. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Slavica Publishers. Thank you to Samantha uh, Farmer for uh, uh, talking about three, three books that Slavica published in the past. Um, before I get to that, I, I, I want to mention, uh, so Ben, at the beginning of your, uh, uh, in your introduction uh, this morning, you talked about how we would probably be talking about some of our various enthusiasms. And I, I want to mention one uh, because it, it, your invitation uh, made me think about a project that I've been involved with for the past few years in a slightly different way. And I started looking for something and, and found it. Uh, and so now it's opened up a little avenue of research for us. So some of you know, I've been working with uh, Sybil and Forrester and um, my colleague Miriam Schrager at Indiana University on a, on a new translation or on a translation, there's never been a full translation of, of Vladimir Propp's um, historical roots of the wonder tale, Istarichske uh, Korni Volshebni Skalski. And uh, uh, we've been at it for a few years and we're almost done. Um, and it became, it, we knew that the, the book was a, a continuation, in fact, of, the, of his earlier book, the Morphologia Skalski, which was translated into English and published as Morphology of the Folk Tale. And I had known that book because I read it in graduate school and knew it for a long time. What I really didn't know was that I was only ever reading the second edition. It's the one that everybody reads, the second edition, which was published by the University of Texas in 1968. And I had never really asked myself, uh, what about the first edition? <laughs> Where was that? And when I looked into it, I, re I found it and it wasn't hard, but it's not widely available except in some libraries. And it was published in 1958, 10 years before that by the Indiana University Research Center in Anthropology, Folklore and Linguistics as publication number 10. I'm holding it in my hands because I got it from storage yesterday. Um, and uh, a little bit more about it uh, just because I, it, I, found, I find the whole publication history rather fascinating. So this was a research center at Indiana that existed for about 15 years. It put out uh, uh, quite a few volumes. The, the folklore librarian sent me the list yesterday. Uh, it's, a, it's a strange com compilation because it mixes, as it says, the anthropology, folklore, and linguistics, but it also mixes language pedagogy. So there's some, some pedagogical books in the series. And it, the director of publications was the semiotician. This also provides a kind of a, a key, a clue into the history. The uh, semiotician and um, polymath uh, from uh, originally from Hungary, Tomas uh, Sebuk. And it, it, this was, as I said, pu published in 1958. Uh, we have also found all sorts of really interesting things about the publication history. Apparently, Prop was not happy with this publication, largely because it took out the epigraphs, or at least one of the reasons. It took out the epigraphs that he had for all of the chapters. It's already a pretty dry book with all these diagrams and is a kind of a, a, a way of heading into structuralism. Um, but that actually might have been something of a, mm, well, it was a, it was a, very specific kind of interpretation of the text, put it that way. And this touches on the question that Sibylin asked in the morning or in the earlier sessions about the construction of knowledge, it seems to me, in, in Western scholarship, uh, US, American and, 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 North, and, and European scholarship in particular about uh, Central and Eastern Europe, regardless of, you th of thinking about the politics, this was not an especially sensitive text, but the reception history puts it into a particular context and shapes then approaches to Slavic and East European languages and literatures for, and, and folklore for that matter, for quite some time thereafter. And the epigraphs were all from Goethe, and that already tells you something, it's a slightly different text from the one you read, uh, if you read it. 
Um, and they all have to do with botany and osteology, meaning that it's not a formalist text. It's about uh, the extension of uh, the natural world into the human world. And that's the way Prop apparently thought of this book. So quite a, a, an interesting aspect of, of textual history, but also something about the construction of knowledge, which is how I have to say when Ben, you asked me to take part in this, I immediately thought, this is what we're talking about. The broader context for this is about the construction of and dissemination of knowledge, and in that sense, but in the very narrower Slavic field, and in that sense, dovetails with a conference, a symposium that was held uh, in January at the University of Texas at Dallas that Sean Cotter put together called, I'm going to read it, it's called Transnational Knowledge, a symposium, a symposium on the production and dissemination of scholarship in translation. Um, and so that context puts things in a slightly different context, from a uh, slightly different perspective, let's say, from what we were talking about mostly this morning, which is, I would say, literature. Literature and literature and translation is, of course, a big part of what we uh, usually talk about here, but scholarship um, is uh, equally large, if not larger part. And when you're talking about Slavica in particular, that's where the emphasis lies. Slavica, um, well, Samantha found some titles from way back in the 1980s. Uh, the vast majority of the Slavica titles are not literature. They are in other domains. They're in some kind of scholarship. Uh, you often linguistics, sometimes um, applied linguistics, sometimes pedagogy. There are textbooks, uh, uh, textbooks for and, and grammars for for all the languages of Slavic and East European area area studies. There are also some area studies. There's some some history, um, and that's where the bulk of the of the of the list lies. Um, so if we're looking at things like networks, uh, publishing networks, we were talking about that a little bit in the morning. And um, uh, and the and these many cases, small one person, two person operations that were disseminating this work, we were publishing it and then disseminating this work, they often uh, are characterized by, I'd say, the personal expertise and uh, and tastes in some cases of the people running them. Uh, and I would say that's true of Dalkey Archive as well. I mean, it's a it's a modernist list. Uh, John O'Brien was a modernist, and that's if you if you look at the Dalkey list and think, okay, this is a modernist list, it all makes sense, uh, with some exceptions here and there. Um, and I would say there many of the other ones are are similar. They're they're because they're one person, two person operations. The the person or organizing it is. Uh, is is usually making decisions on that on that on their basis of their expertise, and so if you so being told that if you're told that the two people who have been responsible for Slavica uh, since its inception in 1966 have both been linguists, that also makes a lot of sense. The the four individuals who gave birth to Slavica uh, in 1966 were all four Harvard graduate students at the time. Um, and then uh, in 1997, when it passed over into into Indiana uh, territory, it was uh, George Fowler who was the the prime mover there. And so again, uh, um, uh, the first one was George Gribble, and uh, the second was was uh, uh, George Fowler. Those first four individuals, I'll just tell you their names. Uh, so Charles Gribble operated Slavica uh, from the very beginning until 1997. Um, the other three were Robert A. Rothstein, who uh, re retained a financial stake in Slavica until 1990, but he really wasn't that involved, apparently, after the initial stages of, of Slavica's operation. Then there was a, a Alexander Lipson, uh, and I'll say a little bit more about him in a second. And then the fourth uh, founder was a, a grad student at the time at Harvard, Joseph Manson. Um, who uh, apparently didn't finish his degree and left the field. I don't have any more information about Manson, so I can't say anything more about him, but I'll tell you a little bit more about Lipson and, um, and Rothstein and then Gribble, who was the main, the main force behind it. So Rothstein, uh, uh, as I said, maintained that financial stake, but 
Um, he, his primary work was as a professor of linguistics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Again, another linguist. It tells you something about Slavica's uh, uh, emphasis. And then Lipson, and this ties back to the questions earlier in one of the earlier panels, I believe it was the one uh, that the grad students presented on, about financial structures, about how these presses supported themselves. And in some cases, I have the sense that it was like this example that I'm going to give you. Uh, they had one book that did really well, which enabled them to do a lot of other books that didn't. Um, and that happened occasionally. And in the case of Slavica, the, the early success was this textbook that Lipson put together uh, called A Russian Course. And some of you will remember this. Um, George uh, Fowler has he wrote a description of it at one point, and he, he, I'm just reading from it. This material was delectable if, if presented by a teacher who got it, and a teacher who didn't get it would be unlikely to select this textbook and instead choose one of the dull alternatives, and he lists some of them. The running story of, in the book takes place in a fictional city called uh, Betonograd, uh, something like Concreteville, uh, and then George has an aside, imagine my delight when I eventually discovered that there is a city just off I-65 in Southern Indiana, where Slavica is now located, located called Cementville. Um, the primitive drawings add to the book's charm. And in fact, the second volume concludes with a 30 page cartoon story about Svjerchelevyek or Superman, all drawn in the same style. And just to give you a sense of what that style is, apparently this book did really well it's, and is still in print. Uh, I don't know that anybody uses it much anymore, but um, the first the first chapter begins. It's called Udarniki, uh, shock workers, and so the whole the whole uh, premise of the book is a kind of a satire on on Soviet on Soviet uh, life. And so the first sentence is "Как живут ударники? Ударники живут хорошо. Где они работают? Они работают на заводах. Как они работают? Они работают с энтузиазмом." Uh, что они делают uh, uh, в парках? В парках они думают о жизни. О какой жизни? О жизни на заводах. And it continues in that, in that, um, in that spirit. And apparently it did so well that uh, it subsidized the publication of a whole bunch of other very specialized books. And the, the shorthand version of Slavica's purpose, again, this is a, a fouler uh, way of, of putting it, is that they decided in 1966 that the field needed a specialty outlet for work of high quality but limited market appeal. That immediately tells you a lot. That means they're not going to be selling many of these books. They have to do it in, on the cheap as much as possible. And as a result, they did almost all the editing themselves. They did a lot of the translations. We heard that earlier themselves. Um, or they got people to do them for free. The typesetting was rather primitive. The, 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 the bindings were also rather primitive, though rather solid as well. George has a, a, a description of the, the early 30 years, first 30 years worth as uh, they look like generic cans of peas but they were also as strong as generic cans of peas. And so that was one of the, the arguments that Gribble apparently made for their, their, their uh, viability. They will last and be distinctive on the shelf because of their, uh, of, of their strength. When a little episode, uh, this, so institutional history is not always that interesting, but Slavica actually has some, some color to it. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So it, it existed like this for a while. Uh, these, these initial four people sort of contributing to it quickly. It became three people, then two people, and then it was just Gribble. And so it was just this one person doing the whole thing for a long time. And he was at several different institutions. Um, uh, let me just read a little bit. So uh, Charles Gribble of Ohio State University, in the natural course of events, this is again George Fowler, right? And some of you will recognize George's style here. In the natural course of events, this Gribble had moved around and he had brought Slavica with him as a something called a C corporation. Basically, it's a private, it's a is a private enterprise. It wasn't a nonprofit. He was running it as his own his own business. Um, and uh, I think it might have been a nonprofit, but I'm not sure exactly what the status was, whether it was a federal nonprofit or, or not. 
So uh, in the in the natural course of events, Gribble might have donated to it to to his university upon retirement. But he felt that the university had harassed him over the years for devoting a major part of his effort to what under certain regimes was often regarded as moonlighting. And he was in no mood to follow that path and didn't trust OSU to keep Slavica alive for the long term. So he grew so as he grew older, he became more worried about securing its future. At the same time, George Fowler had become, this is George writing about himself in the third person, George Fowler had dis become disillusioned with specialized research in theoretical Slavic linguistics while preparing for tenure, which he received in April of 1997, so the same year, and had become interested in contributing to this to his field in a more general way. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a second because I think it's really important. A reflections piece by Gribble published in the Journal of Slavic Linguistics served as a catalyst for Fowler's thinking, and he spent much of the 1996-97 academic year, that's the year he was coming up for tenure, remember, uh, knocking on doors around the university in search of funding in partnership with then chair, Professor Emeritus, now Professor Emeritus, uh, Henry Cooper. Okay, so imagine this scenario, George is coming up for tenure, really sick of doing Slavic uh, structural theoretical linguistics. He wants to contribute to the field in a more general way. He sees the Gribble's essay about Slavica. He is in charge, he's in touch with Gribble about his misgivings about uh, the future of the press as, as he's not able to devote as much time to it and is getting ready to retire. And George then sets out uh, going hand uh, uh, hat in hand uh, to various uh, parts of Indiana University looking for a place to put it, and eventually they bought it, um, they, and uh, so he he found a partnership with the university graduate school, which put up the money to buy this thing. Uh, there was a there was some there was some uh, institutional oh, uh, haggling, I guess, that made it difficult, um, and that had to do with the fact that. IU and as its charter doesn't didn't have the uh, uh, authority to buy a corporation, and so they had to somehow they they wriggled around this, and made it now a, a, into an auxiliary unit of the institute of Indiana University uh, with its own budget, its own board. It's basically semi-independent, um, uh, but it's it's thought of as part of the Slavic department, and so that's actually quite quite something that they were able to do that. I don't think that anything like that would be possible now, that somebody going out could say, you know, I want to buy this press. And what does it do? Well, it does specialty stuff in my field and it doesn't make any money. And in fact, for a good 10 years from 2000 until I think more like 11 years, 2011, the press ran at a deficit. So imagine that on top of everything else and how many institutions would agree to keep it around running at a a pretty stiff de deficit, I believe. It took them a while to bring it under control. They didn't know what they were doing financially, and that was part of it. They weren't publishers. Um, and so learning the ropes of how to publish in a affordable way uh, was part of, of uh, Slavica's mission in those years, and they, they finally figured it out. So this was uh, the transition. Now it's been, so that was 20, so it did, 20, 31 years under Gribble. Now they were in the 25th year under under uh, George Fowler's uh, reign. Uh, as as we mentioned, as I mentioned earlier in the chat, I'm I'm not the says the chair of the Slavic department. I serve on the board and I serve as the chair of the board, uh, the the editorial board of of the um, of the press, um, but but not as the director of the press. And that that's George's George's uh, work and. Um, I wanted to say one more bit about that, which is that um, this 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 charge of moonlighting uh, is, I think, especially pernicious um, in certain fields. The idea that the kind of public humanities scholarship that actually gets gets rec recognized in some circles that George was doing for you know a good twenty years. Uh, but was not being rewarded for and was not being recognized for is really common in research universities. So if you are doing public humanities work or public scholarship in any in any capacity, unless it's really, really 
uh, noteworthy. And so it's being it's it's your op eds being published in 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 the New Yorker or, who, or whoever New York Times. Let's say um, it's not likely it's not likely to to be recognized by let's say promotion and tenure committees. Much the same way that translation uh, work is not particularly translation of scholarship. Um, so uh, the most recent developments for Slavica have been a widening of its of its uh, uh, portfolio of of publishing. And as I mentioned, it's the bulk of its translate bulk of its work uh, from the beginning has been in in uh, in a fairly narrow domain of language literature scholarship, uh, including linguistics, uh, uh, pedagogy, so textbooks, um, grammars, lexicons, things like that. But in 2015, George had the idea of expanding into literary translation in a more serious way. And so he launched, the, the press launched the uh, imprint called Three String Books, uh, I don't recommend that you go and try to look at the Slavica website at the moment because it's in transition and I don't know how uh, how full it is in terms of uh, all of those all of those um, recent publications. But three string started off uh, in 2014, I believe, with a uh, translation of um, let me just get the list here and then I'll finish up. And the first one was um, Boris Paplovsky's Apollon Bizabrazov, and in uh, translation, uh, a second one and that was 2015, and then a Valentin Rasputin uh, 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 collection, and um, and they've also done works from Czech, I believe, uh, and Slovak, and Serbian. Uh, the Slovak one by uh, that was mentioned earlier by um, Samantha was in that list, and, and my timer is telling me I'm I've got I've got to finish. And um, then mo more recently, uh, since Slavica takes a, a broad a broad scope of a broad a bo um, view of its publishing sphere, it has a publication called um, uh, A Life at Noon. Which was translated by Shelley Fairway the Vega from the Kazakh. Uh, this is 2019 by Talasbek As Asim Kulov. Um, and you know this this is the new direction that Slavic has been taking. Uh, that is, it still does some fest shifts. It still does some some language focused work, but it also has been trying to expand its its literary translation activities. I think to to good effect. I would really like to see it do more work um, online and be a little bit more what nimble as a small press it does have that uh, capacity um, including uh, works that would be very current right now um, if it if it were in a position to do this we would be publishing right now translations of let's say short stories and poetry from uh, ukraine uh, and very very timely, but we're not in a position to do it. So I'm hoping we can we can develop in that um, in that manner in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, we're going to move right to uh, Joanna Chechak, and please, Russell, if you could stick around for uh, for a little while, we'll have some Q and A afterwards. Sure, I'll stick around. Can you. you guys hear me? OK. Well, thank you, Russell, for your great dispatch. And I wanted to thank everybody, including those that are uh, joining us remotely. Um, my thanks goes to also to um, Benjamin Paloff. Um, by the way, his um, Tokarczuk contribution was really great. <laughs> so, um, And I wish to share with you uh, a project that is in the making. But before we get to it, um, I would like to pay a little homage to the, um, to the great literary journals of the Midwest that have been very friendly to poetry and translation, which is still quite unusual. Um, so uh, the theme of this conference is bridges over, um, over walls. So I wanted to show you a great wall, and here it is. All right, that's not it even. 
So, um, um, these are places that accepted and published poetry in my translation, but there are m many more. I mean, it's amazing. It's impressive. Um, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we have some, um, some known titles, um, some that unfortunately left us, like the Field Magazine and Triquarterly, which is, um, that's, that's difficult, but, um, but um, some that are still with us and are reinventing themselves. So, um, something to note about these Midwestern literary journals is that they recognized early on that um, not being one of, uh, on one of the coasts, they could transform themselves um, by uh, not just being local, but, but embracing the globe, by welcoming, uh, inviting literature and translation into these journals. And by that, in that way, they became bridges to everywhere. So um, now to quote James Brown, I'm going to take it to the bridge, another bridge, a distinguished colleague, Michelle Krutikov, and I really am so sorry that he left because <laughs> here he is. Um, and this is uh, something that happened on this campus. Um, it was uh, the project that I'm working on is uh, the collected works of Zuzana Kinchanka. And in 2016, when I was on this campus giving a talk on a Polish playwright, uh, Stanisław Mrożek, I had coffee with Misha Krucikow. And many co topics were covered in our, during our coffee conversation, but among them was the ACES conference uh, that was going to be held in the summer, summer of 2016 in Lviv. And um, Misha generously kind of told me about the intellectually vibrant institution in Lviv, the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe, now home to dozens of refugees um, from all parts of Ukraine. I actually heard them on NPR the other day, uh, Sofia talking about their response. They're all cooking dinners for refugees. That's, that's the uh, sad reality. But, um, but it is thanks to, to Misha that um, not only did I get to participate in lectures, but I um, spent the, uh, the um, summer of 2017 on a digital fellowship, Humanities in the Center. Um, and uh, that led uh, to me discovering um, uh, the translations of the poet that was translating, Zuzana Kinchanka. They were housed in, in Lviv um, in the Stefanik Library. I don't know how many of you um, have ever heard of Kinchanka. She is, <laughs> okay. Um, um, well, she's, she's emerging. I mean, she's emerged in Poland and she's making it to, to United States. So, um, so um, um, I will um, I will say a little bit. So um, she was born Zuzana Paulina Ginsburg to a Russian-speaking Jewish family in Kiev in 1917, and shortly after her birth, her parents had to flee the Russian Revolution, and they um, landed in Rivne, Rivne which has storied history, but uh, as of 1921, I believe, it was a Polish town. So let me just show you. Okay, so this is, um, important thing to note is the difference between Galicia and Volhynia, and the Volhynia is kind of in, in, in yellow, uh, which was, um, Rivne was, was not an unusual, I mean, was not an unusual Volhynian town in that it was 70% Jewish when, when she was there. So. Um, so Ginchanka's um, um, sort of, um, uh, just to kind of, her life, you know, Ginchanka's life unfortunately was, was cut short by the Shoah. She was killed by the Nazis uh, near Krakow almost at the end of the war in, uh, in May of 1944. Uh, she was barely 27 years old. Um, but most of the poetry that she um, wrote during the time when she was tw from tw when she was 22 to 27 has been lost, except for uh, three poems. These translations that I will um, talk about, and um, so um, uh, it was in Rivne uh, that Ginchanka. Um, I'm gonna, going to show you the town. This is 1921. 
that um, Ginchanka um, essentially went to um, French kindergarten, Polish gymnasium. That's where she adopted the name Zuzana Ginchanka and adopted Polish as uh, a language of poetic ex expression. So um, it was still as a schoolgirl that she wa uh, wrote some of the most um, of her most uh, well-known poetry. Um, so, um, and um, it is a humbling experience to me to be translating in Chanka because I approached it as, oh, you know, here's a poet who never had a chance to realize uh, her um, poetic genius. Um, but, uh, you know, so in a way I will be finishing an unfinished project. But much to my surprise, um, this is a, po the, this is a um, a project that has been so humbling because, um, you know, I'm dealing with a 15-year-old who has been, 16-year-old, uh, 17-year-old, who, who has been uh, an amazingly, not only um, um, powerful voice, well-formed, um, completely in control of form, but also uh, a, um, a, a great thinker, someone who is um, always um, much more logical than it appears at first when you, um, when you um, begin to translate a poem. So, um, so Polish, um, let me just kind of move you. Oh yeah, this is, uh, she's in the center here. And this, this is the, um, the uh, photograph, one of very few photographs that remain um, of her in, um, in her Rivne Gymnasium, Polish Gymnasium. Um, and three, three of the girls are Jewish, actually. So, um, so but Polish scholars uh, generally emphasize the assimilated nature of, of Ginchanka's upbringing, um, and hence never really focus on her, uh, on her uh, poems uh, that have frequent references to the five books of Moses. So, and as, because as a, as a Jewish girl, um, Gintanka was not taking catechism classes, but of course um, uh, had, um, had the religious instruction in Judaism. And uh, as you'll see, because I'm, I'm going to, oh, yeah. Um, um, as you'll see, um, she, will, she wrote her own Song of Songs at the age of 15. Uh, she conjured up her um, own story of Noah's Ark and her version of Genesis. Um, and uh, in the poem that I'm about to read, not only does she take issue with creation story, the separation of, of uh, earth and sky, but she also casts herself as a creator of her universe, where she is tasked um, with finding herself. Uh, Wisława Szymborska, some, some 60 years later, also has a problem with a creation uh, story when she talks about, um, you know, separating, dividing earth, um, be, earth and sky. It's not the way to think about its wholeness. Um, it's one of the, one of um, Szymborska's um, most irreverent um, poems where she naturalizes the supernatural I eat the sky, excrete the sky, if you, if you uh, guys recall. Um, but in any case, so, um, so let me just read it. Um, uh, this is called Vyashnina na Marginesia, which is also, she casts herself in a kind of, in the role of a rabbinical commentary, because what's on the margin? Um, you have a, a commentary. Um, so here it is, commentary, Vyashnina na Marginesia. I was not made from dust nor unto dust shall I return. I did not come down from heaven, nor shall I return there. Like a glass vault, I am the heavens. I am the earth, like, fer like the fertile soil. I did not escape from anywhere, nor shall I return there. I do not know of other beyond, beyond myself. And the full lungs of the wind and in the calcified rocks scattered here, I must find myself. So um, I'm just checking the time. There's all of a sudden I lost the, how am I doing? 
Okay, wonderful. So, um, well, a better known aspect of Vichanka's poetry is her feminist um, vitalism, as it's brilliantly um, engaged by uh, Agata Rashkevich in her bi pioneering book on Ginchanka. But what strikes us in the post humanist era is the solidarity with the animal kingdom, the vitality of the natural world, which is contrasted with a self-imposed sterility and virginity of the human realm. Virginity, virginity emerging as a unnatural state. And here's a 15-year-old girl writing about virginity. Um, so let me just get to this. Yeah. So um, we, a frenzy of hazel trees disheveled by rain, a scented, nutty, nutty, buttery crush. Cows give birth in the, human, in the humid air, in barns blazing like stars. Oh, ripe currants and lush grain, sapid to overbrimming. Oh, she-wolves feeding their young, their eyes sweet like lilies. Sap drips like apiary honey. Goat udders sug like pumpkins. The white milk flows like eternity in the temple of maternal bosoms. And we? In cubes of peach wallpaper, like steel thermoses, hermetic beyond contemplation, entangled up to our neck in dresses, conduct proper conversation. So um, I'm going to kind of now fast forward um, uh, as much as I would love to, to read more translations to my findings in the Stefanuk Library uh, in Lviv, uh, which it turned out was completely closed when I went there and had to be literally unlocked by Sofia Kohut. Uh, the library, uh, you know, the librarian who, um, who allowed us to uh, walk in. Um, and uh, in the archives of the library, I found two books to which Ginchanka contributed her translations, uh, and uh, as well as the magazines, the, um, the Soviet-sponsored magazines, Nove Vidno Krengi, Alma Literatsky, and Czerwony Standard. Um, which was actually a newspaper. I don't know if you guys know, but it, this was a kind of a period where Poland was attacked on both sides. So all the um, writers and, 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 and painters and, and poets went to Lviv uh, in 39, only to find that it was attacked by the Russians. And uh, so she joined uh, a union of uh, Ukrainian writers um, and started to translate Ukrainian poetry. But um, as you know, with many poets uh, who work under censorship, translation becomes a way to, spoke, to speak freely to topics that are taboo. So uh, it, it is really important to kind of examine their choices. And some are purely political. And uh, her translations of Pavlo Tychina are such. I mean, you know, she, she probably did not want to translate a poem uh, devoted to Dzerzhinsky, but, uh, but that bought her, um, you know, probably a uh, five extra square meters of, uh, of residence. So, um, so it is in the Czerwony Standard that um, Ginchanka published the translation of uh, Taras Shevchenko's untitled poem, which I have both here in Ukrainian and in Ginchanka's Polish translation. And currently, uh, engaged and in, in working on, um, it's a translation with my graduate student at Kent State. Um, and I hope that there will be many more translations of um, Taras Shevchenko, given how important his work is and how clearly and strongly it speaks to our present times. So um, I wanted, to, oh yeah, this is the, this is from Czerwony Standard. That's the, uh, and I wanted to um, ask Svetlana, actually, who is joining us, um, 
uh, to read the poem in the Ukrainian, because it's an, it's an amazing poem. I don't know if she's... Can, yes, I, I think I, we have yes, Svetlana I, on yes, Zoom. Yes, 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 I am on Zoom. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so do you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Thank you. That was a last minute moment, but I did have a, I mean, like a, a notice, I'd say, but I had a chance to put on my Vishavanka because I do believe that uh, reading Shevchenko in Ukrainian uh, would be inappropriate to read without Ukrainian Vishavanka. So there, there we are. Anyway, um, I'm going to start. Um, мені однаково, чи буду я жити в Україні, чи ні? Чи хто згадає, чи забуде мене в снігу, на чужині? Однаковісінько мені. Неволі виріс, ми з чужими. І неоплаканий своїми в неволі, плачучи, умру. І все з собою заберу. Малого сліду не покину на нашій славній Україні, на нашій, не своїй землі. І не пом'яне батько з сином, не скаже синові, молись, молися, сину, за Україну його замучили колись. Мені однаково, чи буде той син молитися, чи ні? Та не однаково мені, як Україну, злі люди присплять в каві і в вогні, її окраденою сплять. Ох, не однаково мені. Good, give, gives me chills. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so, Rory, Finland um, has eloquently engaged um, Shevchenko's subaltern critique of the Russian imperial expansionist stance, which uh, also found its troubling reflection in Russian poetry. Somehow the empire never gets the desire of the subaltern nation uh, to be able to get their own fate right. And um, witness, you know, we've witnessed so many instances of it, of, but uh, I recently was reminded of the Chicken Kiev speech of George W. Bush in 1991. Um, but in the poem, um, you have the striking uh, echoes of uh, Shevchenko's kind of polemic with uh, Pushkin Exegi Monumentum. Uh, Pushkin kind of remarks on, on Horace's ode, um, where Pushkin can confidently proclaim his immortality through his poetry. Shevchenko's stance is one of being indifferent to fame, uh, being knowing that his poetry uh, could not achieve um, the same sort of prominence as Pushkin's poetry would, no matter um, you know his um, problems with the czar. Um, Shevchenko's stance is that of one who is indifferent to fame, indifferent uh, to being kind of um, remembered, known. But what raises his ire, uh, what, raise, what, uh, what he rails against, and what he's not indifferent to is that cunning conquerors who waste no effort to assure that Ukrainian nation lulled um, and subjugated uh, is woken and destroyed through um, um, fire, which is the last sort of lines. Lecz to mi nie jest obojętne, gdy chytrzy ludzie Ukrainę uśpią, owładną ją do szczętnia, potem w ogniu zbudzą podli. Ach, to mi nie jest obojętne. So I can only speculate why Ginchanka chose to translate Shevchenko and why she chose to translate this poem in particular, but it definitely resonates with her own critique of exclusionary nationalism. Um, remember, uh, you know, um, Ginchanka 
lived her entire life in Poland, but she was never able to uh, acquire Polish citizenship and uh, was con constantly attacked uh, in the press in Warsaw. In, um, in Volhynia, I mean, when, you know, when you're in a largely Jewish um, city, things are different, but her confrontation with uh, virulent anti-Semitism in Warsaw um, taught her something about, um, um, about um, you know, the exclusionary um, way to which Polish language is even been, uh, put to. So um, in her last poem, and I'm fast forwarding to the last poem that um, survived, uh, which is also a reference to Exegi Monumentum by Horace, uh, from which she uh, takes one line, non omnis moriar. Um, Ginchanka protests the denial um, of her afterlife, uh, which instead of leaving a you know, poetic monument, she's reduced to having only her worldly possessions, which then will be plundered. This is what survived. It was a, a, a miracle that uh, it survived um, um, Ginchanka's arrest in 1942, her hiding in, in Krakow in 1944, and it was um, delivered after the war uh, by her friend to, um, to a Polish journal and published in 1947. But this is a this poem is unprecedented in the history of poetry as it is the one that saved as one of the main pieces of evidence in the trial and a basis for four four year prison sentence of the woman who denounced the poet uh, as a Jew to the Nazis in 1942 Lviv and this is a po poet uh, this is a uh, woman whom the poet names in the poem. So the poem itself becomes, you know, a chief piece of evidence. And I have this, um, and of course, because it was a, uh, it was written during uh, the, you know, the Nazi occupation of Poland, the uh, Jewish possessions were kind of crossed out as you have only the word uh, Z-H with, uh, so this is the, um, I, kind of went through um, the whole um, case of, of uh, Ginchanka, you know. Um, um, it's not only that the, um, that the woman, Homina, who's named in the poem, but also her son was, was um, received a, um, he received a one uh, year sentence uh, based on the poem. So let me just go to the poem and you will kind of understand um, why <laughs> Ginchanka in a way um, felt an affinity for Shevchenko, who wrote this poem in 1840s. Uh, she's writing in 1942. So let me just read it to, to you um, in my English translation. Non omnis moriar. Non omnis moriar means I will not fully die, except that here is done with a biting ir irony, because the only thing that will, you know, survive are her Jewish possessions. So. One more time. Non omnis morier, my proud estate, meadows of tablecloths, bastions of armoires, miles of bedsheet, and all my fine linens and dresses, bright dresses, shall be my bequest. Here I have left no heir. Let then your hand then pick through my Jewish possessions. O oh, brave spouse of a snitch, Meet Miss Homina from Lviv, an eager informant, a Volksdeutscher's mother. May they suit you and yours. Why leave them to strangers? This is no song, dear friends, nor an empty name. I remember you the way you remembered me to the coming Shupo, reminding them of me. So friends, break out the goblets, drink to my wake, and to your riches. Killings and tapestries, plate, platters and candlesticks. May you drink all night, and as the day breaks, set off on the search for jewels and gold in feather beds, mattresses, 
sofas and rugs. May hands, many hands make light work, so it shouldn't take long. Clumps of horsehair and sea, stru and sea grass stuffing, clouds of torn pillows and billows of dawn will cling to your hands and turn them to wings. And my blood will congeal fiber and feather and transform into angels, those now merely winged. So um, time is up. I, you know, I can take any questions, but thank you so much. Thank you. And we do have, um, we are, we're running just a, a few minutes behind, but we do have time for some questions or comments. Uh, again, anyone joining us over Zoom is welcome to add a question or comment to the Q&A function at the bottom of their Zoom screen. And if we could get Professor Valentino back on the uh, screen, I think is hopefully possible. I see him on my Zoom screen. Can we get him um, almost there? There he is. Oh, there he is. Excellent. Um, so are there questions or thoughts from our gathered audience or else uh, anyone from uh, from the Q&A uh, from the from Zoom? Thanks so much, Graham. Uh, thank you both so much for for your contributions today. This is great. Even though I'm not familiar with the literature, I feel like I'm learning so much about translation, publication, um, so many things. My question was kind of for uh, Joanna, but I think it could perhaps, um, I'd be interested in, in Russell's thoughts too. Um, you mentioned, Joanna, translation becomes a way to speak about topics that are taboo. Um, you know, in one moment, and I was just thinking about, you know, is. Uh, just if you could, you know, elaborate or say more on that, because to me that just sounds so interesting. And um, you know, I'm thinking about does translation becomes a become a way to speak about topics that are taboo via how they are translated or via the text themselves? Um, there's so many ways that 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 seems um, like just a really rich insight. So I wonder if you could well, elaborate. I can I can take it. Um, so first of all, I always think of translator as a curator. Translator chooses the works that they will translate. And there are certain, certain works that speak at a given time. This was a time where um, the Russians you know, invaded Poland. Uh, this is the time when they rounded up all the you know, major intellectuals and shot them dead in Katyn. You know? This is, um, you know, she, she knew about it. And they, you know, they all had relatives that, um, that were kind of disappeared. So the choice of that particular sort of, you know, speaking um, about things that may not be as important, such as fame, such as, you know, um, being able to, to kind of be remembered. But uh, to choose a poem where you kind of think about the nation and also establishing her own her be, being on a Nansen paper, papers, you know, never being a citizen, but through poetry, through translation, establishing her right to be a Polish poet, you know, and that's that's in this particular instance, I think that's um, that's very important. She also translated Lesia Ukrainka, an amazing Ukrainian um, woman poet, um, and uh, you know, and then uh, and also. With the other po poem, I mean, uh, you know, you kind of take um, Latin, the lingua franca, and sort of play with it, subvert it completely, and, and subvert entire Polish romantic tradition, something they couldn't talk about. But it's, this is a poem that is a dialogue with Słowacki and his conception of what it means to be a national poet. She had a very different conception that is very close to Taras Shevchenko's conception. So maybe, Russell, I'm sorry. No, I, I think that's a great answer. Uh, I'll just add that, um, yeah, in terms of the way that you translate, there's uh, actually quite a bit of scholarship about that, uh, particularly from feminist translators. Uh, you can you can contextualize things in particular ways, so you can write about, so your, your preface, your notes, the kind of apparatus that goes with it. Uh, so if you're dealing with, let's say, a, a, a mis misogynistic text, let's say, or, or a racist text, you can 
do things around the text. And then you can also hijack it. <laughs> there are, there are, I mean, that used to be a term. I think it was a term of, of, of translation studies in the 90s. Hijacking was a technique that some people thought was, was useful in some contexts. It's certainly possible for, for I mean, these, the texts that we are just talking about right now, they're all in the public domain. <laughs> right? So you could do things with them if you are a translator and you want to. Um, and I, and yeah, it's a, it's actually a, it's an opportunity for some authors to take a text and change little things here and there so that it does something slightly different for our context today. Thank you. I was really fascinated by the collage of Midwest literary journals that you began with. And I was also really deeply struck by the incredible translation of Testament that you read at the end. And it struck me that um, while establishing her right to be a Polish poet, your translation of um, Mchenka, Shevchenka, Shevchenka yeah. um, also um, does a lot of work to establish networks of affiliation to read her in English. And that um, I'm just wondering to what degree you are thinking about your translation as somehow circulating in the literary context produced by the Midwestern journals that you just referenced at the beginning of your talk, that the idiom you're choosing to translate her into makes her legible to us in other ways. And um, you know, what, what kind of an idiom did you think about when you created this translation of her that I found so beautiful and resonant with other American poets. So. Um, well, um, I guess I'll, I'll take the question. Please, <laughs> yeah, do. Directed yeah. to me. <laughs> so, but I wanted to just um, say, you know, when you, um, when you translate, I, um, it takes me a really long time to develop a voice um, for a poet. And here's a poet who was, um, writing a satirical, biting um, kind of poems. Um, so that was one voice. Um, I mean, really wicked. I don't think I have as much wickedness in me as she had. And also, uh, in this particular poem, this is someone who is uh, standing up to the big boys, to all the national romantic poets. It's very hard to do, uh, you know, in English. Uh, you have the um, help of, of, of uh, Horace, so in a way you, you can help these um, sort of lines resonating with some of the English translations of Horace. Um, so, um, but every poem requires a different strategy, I think. And um, what I love about the, you know, the uh, these uh, the, these journals is that they're truly international. It's not you know you're not really your your translation is in dialogue with other translations also. And in 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 each each kind of uh, that's why you have good editors who create a context for which the um, the the poems translations uh, pieces of literature they kind of engage one another. And a good issue that is put together by a thoughtful um, you know, the editor can, can do that. And that is just a unique sort of moment, instant, um, that may be very different when you take it out of that volume, out of that issue, you know. So it's, it's a very hard thing to do, and you never know what the future of the translation will be, you know. So but I don't know if I answered your question. Actually, I have, a, I have a question. It's for both of you, but it's for it's prompted by something Russell was talking about with regard to Slavica and 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 indicating, I think, very reminding us. Um, also, also echoing back to what we were doing this morning about the uh, the role of of editorial interest in shaping this material as it enters into English. And uh, and if, and Joanna, you just alluded to the role of magazine editors. 
Well, and, Russell was one. For, and, 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 you, Russell, and, and you were you were one for many many and, years. And I was one for I, I did this for some years yeah. too. And I, I guess and 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 it and doing so made me very sensitive to this question. There is a there's a way in which. Uh, the editorial preferences would seem then to create a different kind of, a slightly different kind of echo chamber from the one that uh, uh, Jesse LeBeouf was referring to this morning. Um, the, I'm thinking of the kind of echo chamber where the, where the literature that makes it into global circulation through English is cherry picked because it reads like or sounds like, or more specifically, deals with the issues we've decided that Eastern Central European literature is supposed to be about, which means that things that are, um, that are hitting familiar themes of resistance to tyranny and, uh, and the, 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 the search for freedom in the expressive word and that sort of thing, one finds text after text after text after text, and then increasingly one finds American critics writing essays about, say, Polish or Russian poetry that says Russian poetry is about X. Polish poetry is about Y, which is the kind of absurdity that no one in the, in the, in, you know, in their, speaking of their own national literature would ever say something like this, right? So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about how editors may inadvertently do a disservice to the literature by narrowing what it can be, by curating it sort of into echo chambers or, or preconceived notions of what the literature is supposed to be about. Yeah, that's a great point, Ben. Uh, so uh, when I took over the editor at, at the Iowa Review, uh, they used to run a, a segment uh, that, that was just for the writers of the International Writing Program. So the International Writing Program would bring in, I don't know, about 30 30 writers every fall, they'd be there for about three months, they would generate a bunch of work. And then there was a, a special section in the Iowa Review where they would publish some of those that work. And one of the first things I did was eliminate that section because, because, <laughs> everybody, because everybody skipped it unless they were interested in the international literature, right? So I wanted it to be spread around, but then that, that does change things quite a bit and your, your your question about how it changes things is really is really is really good, um, and I I think that a lot of the time editors do not integrate interrogate their choices enough, right? They put things next to other things because it speaks to them, right? Or it 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 seems effective, or but they're not they're not articulating in very careful ways why it seems effective or why it goes next to those other things. It might be because it's from the Balkans and we have this association with the Balkans is violent, right? And so we put it there. It's next to this other violent poem. Um, and I think that happens all the time. So it's, a, it's something to be aware of uh, for, for editors um, and you know, to, to militate against as much as possible to, to, to try and counteract that tendency to, to sequester them into, into comfortable and conventional places. Well, um, I have to say that I, you know, I've been surprised uh, by the fact that I have takers for Ginchanka, because it is very difficult poetry. It's quite ornate, um, and um, and also uh, because she is, um, you know, she was writing in the '30s, uh, and yet, strangely enough, the the her posthumanism is very current, uh, and maybe that's why. Um, the fact that you know that she, um, um, the fact that she was constantly interrogating herself and kind of um, the fact that she was she was not really, I don't know how she managed to do it, but she said the word kurva in a poem when she was 16 years old and she was able to publish it. I can't believe it. I mean, she you know she was from a nice family. Kurva means whore, and it's worse than a whore to a to someone who is you know, uh, you know to to a Polish ear. Even right now, if you're from a nice family, which she was from, it sounds horrible. And this was an encounter that she has with a prostitute. They are kind of walking towards each other, and and they kind of are looking at each other, kind of not. And it's just an amazing poem, and. And the word kurva appears, so it's, 
yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's 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 odd, uh, but I'm surprised and I'm elated because it's very hard to place poetry in translation. Um, and I don't know. I mean, you are absolutely right that there's an echo chamber, and that's why probably we need to write notes because then we kind of insist on the fact. Okay, maybe it it is it looks like it to you, but actually, look at this. You know, this is a woman who is taking on the romantic bards, you know. And this is a woman who says, well, it is, screw you, you know. You are not allowing me to, to have a child even. You are not allowing me to, I, I have incredible poetic prowess. You're not allowing me to produce yet another poem. And all you want to reduce me to is my possessions. And that's not right. So it's a protest poem um, of a kind that is, yeah. Sure, no, I mean, um, that was a fantastic presentation, and I, I, I only just now, as you were talking about the screw you part, excuse me, I didn't mean to turn that into the central point of the but it's, it's also like Francois Villon's testaments, which are also a giant F you, you know, where and, I, I don't have a damn thing. Here, take it, you know. It's and so Shimborska translated him. Shimborska translated yeah, him in 1982. Yeah. During, uh, she made, you know, she had selected these poems uh, about French Revolution when Soviet tanks were on Polish borders. And all of a sudden, you know, the, the sort of uh, censors were asleep because they thought she was, you know, translating uh, French Revolution in her poetry. But beyond, she also translated. That's fantastic because that, I, I knew that your translation reminded me of something, and that's exactly what it was, which is another way of smuggling contraband in. The ultimate outsider poet who comes from the Middle Ages gets recycled again and again for other poets to sort of write themselves into the tradition. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, we're, we're just a little bit over time, um, but it's a great conversation. I just, and I don't want it to end quite yet. Are there, is there, are there any other qu questions from the floor? There is one question from Zoom. Um, and this is from uh, Gente Nishku, who's a uh, graduate student in comparative literature whom I want to uh, thank also for having made some, some contributions to our online exhibit. Um, and it's also worth noting that she is uh, doing a, a lot of her dissertation research specifically on uh, the institution of the Iowa Writer, International Writers Program. Mm -hmm. um, but she wanted, she, she asked a, a very direct question, which is, and thank you <laughs> for doing so, but her, her very direct question is whether you could say some more about how uh, Kichanka's poem was used as, as uh, evidence uh, against her uh, denouncer, which is, as you pointed out in your presentation, Joanna, it's a, that's quite unusual. <laughs> yes, um, this, was, this was still at a time where um, uh, trials of, um, you know, of uh, Poles who denounced Jews were allowed. So there was this narrow moment in Polish history where that was actually... Uh, could be done. So this was done, I think, in '49, I, be, I believe. You know, um, and it is it is because um, not all of her friends died, and you know, and they wanted to uh, Homina, that woman, uh, you know, not only denounced her but many others. A lot of them did not make it, and uh, and uh, so, but but there was no evidence, and here it was a poem. How, how odd, you know, but how incredible. But this was just, this was really against all odds that the poem, tra that, that the poem survived, that it survived, you know, till 40, you know, till, till 1945. And then, so yeah, so there was a huge sort of, um, it was an interrogation of people who lived in this Yabonovsky, um, a street in, in uh, Lviv where she, Kid. She, um, because Lviv had a large Armenian population, she looked very dark. Uh, so she could pass for an Armenian. And then she had this Nansen passport that initially uh, confused everybody because it was a, it's a passport that states what uh, citizen, you, uh, what country you're not a citizen of. 
<laughs> so, so, you know, go figure that. So she had it taped to her door and, and uh, you know, Ukrainian police w walked by uh, and did not uh, denounce her as a Jew, you know. So that was, that was really, is that answering the question? Yes, and I, 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 it's, it's really, it's, no, this is fascinating and I, I hope we can continue this conversation and into the future. I, at this point, I think we should probably thank our guests. Uh, unless there are any other questions, are we? I, it just in the interest of time, I think we should, uh, we should probably thank our thank guests. You. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Russell, so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Joanna. Thank, uh, thank you so much. We, so uh, the last event of today's uh, symposium is going to be uh, a celebratory reading of Poetry and Translation with uh, Claire Kavanaugh, which was supposed to begin five minutes ago, but I think we, we're just going to take, should we take five minutes? We have to take, we're going to take five minutes and we will, we'll be back in five minutes and then we will have that event. Thank you so much.